All right, we are on. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is January 30th, 2024, and we're here today for bargaining session number 11. Um, we'll start with introductions. My name is Christine Schrode. I'm chief negotiator on behalf of the school board. I'm Sherry, <laughs> Sherry Richardson, coordinator of professional standards. Don Calderon, director of risk management and employee benefits. Carter Morrison, assistant superintendent for finance. Lisa Estevez, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services. Mark Collins, Coordinator, Art, Music, Physical Education, Social Studies, World Languages. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? <laughs> That's it. Pat Holtz, MCEA. Susan Rayo, MCEA. Dan Gorstiaga, MCEA. Matt Theobald, President, MCEA. Lonnie Barch, MCEA. Kim Love, MCEA. Julie Sessa, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources for the district. And um, Ms. Schroeder, before we begin, I just wanted to, I know the, the other side of the table is aware, but uh, our chief negotiator, Gary Simmons, is, is, has been delayed um, with a tire issue. Um, he's on his way and should be arriving within probably the next 10 minutes. So he should be here. And we apologize for the delay. It's not a problem. It happens. Um, so we'll do our brief recap and then we can go into some of our discussions. Uh, last week, uh, we had session number 10. MCEA provided a lot of responses to the district's previous language proposals. I'm not going to go through each one, um, but we also had a response to the district's performance pay proposal, and that was annual contract for highly effective would get 2,600, effective 1,950, and then PSC highly effective would get 1,950, and effective would get 1,850. Um, the parties did caucus and. Um, we do have some responses and then we have some items that we're going to need additional time on. So I think uh, we can start with our responses and our proposals for this evening. Um, we, have, we do have a handout that reflects the proposals we'd like to make. And just if, yeah, just, just the language. Just the language. Yep. And if anyone wants to follow along, it starts with Article 6, 6.7. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we wanted to start with, uh, we had some discussions about um, 6.7. It was previously entitled interim teacher, and I know there was a lot of confusion on what that meant. And then if you turn to the next page on 6.12, substitute teachers, they're kind of saying the same thing, so we want to kind of flesh that out. We ha would like to propose for 6.7, this is more of your short-term classroom coverage, so we renamed it from interim teacher to short-term classroom coverage. And really, that's the only substantive change. Um, and again, we want to open up a discussion on, right, we have interim substitutes stricken as well as language, just to clarify what that looks like. Um, but as far as 6.12, we want to kind of have a dialogue with you all on what that looks like in comparison to 6.7, so um, there might be additional proposed changes to that language. Okay. We, we just want to dialogue about that Understood. before. Um, Understood, thank you. And then the next proposed change, I know we discussed last week a little bit about rules and laws available. Uh, previously it was housed in the library, now we have all of it online, so we proposed language change which says all board policies, floor to school laws, and job descriptions will be available to staff on the district's website. So just updating that language and, and saying everything that you need will be available there on the district's website. Wasn't there at this time? 
Oh, we can't, you can't, we can't, can't yeah, you can't participate. I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, the next items that we wanted to discuss. Um, last week, uh, we talked a little bit about the good fit <coughs> section. We had previously proposed striking all of that language and then discussion about our current contract came up. I know we sent you our contract and on our side, we also looked through that contract. And at this point, we're not seeing any language that's problematic. Um, right now, we're only participating in AIT and not good fit. But in the event that down the road we participate in good fit, we believe the language is still appropriate. So we're just proposing no changes to that at this point. Uh, so that's a little bit of a change from last session. And then for Article 7, that's the transfers, reduction, and recall. Uh, just some minor changes in 7.2e. We wanted to shorten that transfer window. And the reason for that is if an employee wants to transfer um, and we allow that through the summer, um, it's difficult to then staff that position for the following year. So we, we shortened up that time frame um, and said that <coughs> it would have to be by the last workday in May for 196 employees and and if you have any question questions about that sherry can speak to that now or yeah, now sure <laughs> sure she can speak to that what now. would happen if positions come up after may then so, that's knocking teachers positions come up after the last day of school very frequently absolutely and, and that's locking a teacher out yeah so so on f down below there an employee requesting a voluntary transfer outside this transfer window must make a written request to both principals and the principals will agree to that transfer. So that's, if it's outside the window, which would be after the last day of May, it would yeah. still be possible. Yeah, some counter on that, because this has happened before. It's a principal, because if you request from both principals, they don't have to release you, do they? They don't. So that's kind of saying if, and I understand why right. you would want to fill the positions, but I think, have it, you know, giving a little yeah, bit of window in that waiting June. for that position to open up. Uh, yeah. Finally opens up, and now they can't take. And it now the principal's it. saying, "No, sorry, you can't go." Which a lot of principals would say, "If you want to go, I'm going to let you go because I don't want you here." If right? You yeah, want to be most here, would. That could happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, Mr. Raymond did ask for me just to please, like, you know, we really want to try to get those transfers completed because by June first we get our best teachers in place, of course, and so it's harder in June. But I do know that. Those transfers do open up after that window, and yeah. Yeah. I would think our principals would be reasonable to help and make kind those of to changes happen. Yeah, okay. yeah. have the principals kind of stay on top of making sure that they post. In right, time absolutely. For to yeah. Take. Okay, and then uh, the next minor change was in 7.2F, and just clean up there, uh, Chief, hum Chief of Human Resources, we changed that, and it now reflects the current title, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Um, if you look at 7.4C, and that will be on top of page 30 there, that's another one of the committee may be formed instead of shall be formed. Um, gives a little bit of leeway for uh, the parties to decide if they feel they need that committee. Um, so that's another one of the shall in May. And then same thing with 7.8, uh, changing the committee from will to may. So for language, those are our proposals for this evening. And then um, we do have a response as well to the performance pay. And Mr. Morrison will be presenting that. Good evening, everyone. Um, technically, we do and we don't. So let me clarify why. Page 
Can I have two, please? A little more? Okay. Uh, yep. Thank you so much. How's that? All right. So I don't think I have enough copies of this one, but I just have a couple. Can everybody hear me now? Okay, so about two sessions ago, um, in response to MCEA's presentation of state data that showed that the average teacher's salary in Martin County School District had fallen, we reached out to the DOE and said, okay, um, tell us how you calculate the average teacher's salary for school districts. We received the formula, so to speak, and the steps on how the DOE calculates the average, average teacher salary for all districts. And we found some very interesting things, to say the least, in how the department calculates the average teacher salary. So on the handout that I've given the, the, your, 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 union member, your union leadership, I'm just gonna go down to the talking points for just one second before we get into the numbers. So if you cast your eyes down at number one, the DOE includes only classroom teachers in their calculations. So your guidance, your media, your program specialists, none of those folks are included in the file. Your MCEA leadership bargains on your behalf for all teachers. So we included all teachers. The DOE only includes, it includes partial year salaries in their computation. They also included the teachers who work more than 196 days. So what we did was, so for example, your 201s, 216s, et cetera, we brought everybody back down to 196 so we can have an apples to apples comparison. The DOE also includes charter schools in the average. Now, I, I, am, I, I am sure that um, MCEA would agree with me that they do not bargain on behalf of charter school teachers. Some are lower, some are higher. It, it depends on what um, charter school you're looking at. That has the capability to swing the average. The other thing is that, and of course, you know, charter school teachers are not members of the bargaining unit. The other one that I found that was very interesting, and that's detailed on your, the second sheet that I gave you, is that the FDOE includes the cost of contracted. Now, I want to make a uh, technical correction to that sentence. If you, would in, if you would strike out the word teachers and put the word services, okay? So they include in their calculation folks that are contracted that come to the district and provide specialized services that we are not able to provide locally. So let me walk you through these two pieces of paper here. So the one that is shaded kind of brown like this, you'll see that's a filter and you'll see the DOE category code charter slash contracted vendor. That is included in the calculation. These people don't are not MBUs, you do not bargain on behalf of these folks. If you look at the primary job code, you'll see 52018, and this other blue sheet is the key to that chart. So 52018 is speech and language pathologist. 52017 is occupational therapist. 52016 is physical therapist, and so on. These are people who you do not bargain, bargain for. They're contracted outside folks. They are included in the file. This is just a, a filter from the file that we received, okay? The DOE does not also include any advanced degrees um, in their calculations. So 
I know particularly that we budget right around a million and a half dollars just for advanced degrees uh, for, your, for your members. Um, I want to then look at the data, if I go up just a hair. So when we recalculated the data, okay, I know by the way, I just want to make a, 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 why number five is so powerful, because if another school district, right, spends more money on outside contracted services versus members in-house, what do you think is gonna to happen to the average? The average is gonna go up. So I just wanted to show you that that is a key element of how the DOE is calculating the average. Um, if you look at the average base salary in 2021 based on our calculation and eliminating and, and putting things on, on a square even basis, the average was 48,362. In 2020, 21-22, the average actually went down, and we own it. But here's why the average went down. If you look right above number one in the two stars, and right here, both the TSIA, which is a, the state teacher salary increase allocation, and the pay for performance, were paid out in, 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 in excuse me, July 25th, 2022, and also October 27th, 2022, respectively. You might remember that at that time we had actually, were going back and forth and we crossed over the fiscal years, okay? So you can see that the average actually went down by $229, almost $230. But if you look over to 22-23, you see the big jump of an increase of 3,335.83. That represents those, that represents two years in 22-23 because we're able to settle and report to the DOE those salaries that were agreed upon and unbargained. Year to date through, um, I think it was January 23rd if I recall, um, the average it, based on our calculations is showing at, six, at 52085. Okay, so down at the bottom, what we did was a comparison of a fair calculation of the average teacher salary versus how the state's doing, doing it. So you can see the average salary in 2021, as reported by the DOE, was 46,415. Our calculation, which we believe to be much fairer, is 48,362, almost $2,000 higher. We own, as I mentioned to you, and there's a reason for the average falling in 21-22, and in 22-23 you can see the rebound because we're able now able to report what we have settled on and bargained, which I've kind of said it at the table anecdotally that it depends upon when we settle. So for right now, if we were to, when we do our October reporting, we haven't settled yet, so of course our numbers are gonna look low. And just finally, just to put some information before you, is that we went back and we looked at our W-2 files. And you know the W-2 is your tax forms. Now to be fair, the information that's coming from the W-2s are all sources of income, not just your average salaries. Some people get, an, some people get Western Zone Supplement or Reading Remediation Supplement, that kind of stuff. So you can see the maximum in 2021 on our W-2 file for instructional was 95,697.82, the median at 56,8, and the mode at 62,7. And the progression over the years, the max is 98,479, the medium is 57,095, and the mode is 60,090.89. And in 22-23, we just finished our W-2 files and tax reporting, and the maximum was for an instructional MBU was a 105, 536.21. The median was right around 65K, and the mode is 66,000. Now, MCEA may or may not be aware of this, but I'm waiting confirmation from one more district where the issues with the average teacher salary statewide and how it's ca calculated were pointed out to some of the bargaining units in different locations from here. 
So I'm waiting on one more confirmation. Some, some of these districts have just gone to impasse, et cetera, and pointed out that there are some issues with how the state calculates the average, average teacher salary. So when I first started, I said, we have a response, but we, we don't. So we had an executive session with the board last night, and we discussed the pay for performance proposal, and they asked me to rework some things. So we don't have a proposal, a response for you tonight, but we will be bringing back a rejiggered proposal, so to speak. So there's some things in the data that concern us, okay? So with that, if there's any questions from MCEA, I'll be more than happy to answer. But we just wanted to pass on that information to you. Thanks a lot, Carter. I, I do have a, a question with respect to the information that was provided. So this spread, this um, document that's presented here on, on the screen, we went ahead and, and calculated or added some things into, into the equation that the DOE didn't take into consideration. Is that my understanding? We eliminated more than what they added in. So okay. for example, the contracted services, mm -hmm. that was some of, some of that data was so skewed, it put the average way up high. Mm -hmm. So we actually took them out. The 201, 260, anybody who worked more than 196, mm -hmm. we brought them down to 196. So because typically, as you know, teachers generally, when you're comparing apples to apples, we do everybody at 196 and seven and a half hours per day. So the, the adjustment to have a, a more fair calculation of, of what MC, MC um, SDs and average annual salaries are, uh, did we do the same approach for the comparables and contiguous districts that were mentioned in? in I'm MCA? glad you asked that question because I have been directed now to, grab, to get the DOE file mm -hmm. because they want to know how we stack up. If I were to take this data and compare it against the state data, I'm now comparing apples to oranges. Would you agree? Right, but uh, right. What, what I want to make sure is, is that the considerations that we took, like adding in the average advanced degree supplement to get. Oh, no, that, if, let me clarify. Okay. I'm sorry, let me clarify. If you notice, I didn't talk about those other areas. Mm -hmm. What I focused on was just the, the, the average base salary only. Okay. So advanced degree supplements and the average millage doesn't contribute to, to your calculation for average Correct. Annual. All we were all we were doing is taking the data and recalculating the average based on what we believe the MCEA bargains for their members in Martin County School District. So as I mentioned before, we will be bringing the board directed me to make some changes to the proposal, and we'll be, we'll be bringing that forward, hopefully by the next session. We've got some calendar issues that we're trying to work out. Okay. Gary, I believe you might have a presentation this afternoon. I do. I can load it up for you or try to get it in here. Is Chris here? Chris Hall? Oh. Is it on a flash drive, Gary? I have one. I'm going to hack into it. I'm going to help you get some of my work. You <laughs> help me out. I have another flash drive to work on quicker. Offer that for your presentation. All right, so there you go. So this, here, you can choose from there. Yes, we have the, um, what you want to appreciate it.
side part. So that, that's a, um, a lot to digest for the moment. Sure. So um, I know that, that we're going to have to take the information that you've provided and, um, and try to dissect this. And then we'll we'll um, be ready for your your counter proposal in the next bargaining session. At this um, juncture, is it possible that I could take a five minute a five minute caucus to discuss this proposal with with my team very quickly? We'll just step in there. Five minutes. Thanks. Oh, you're gonna. Yeah. For, for the um, allowance of the, that quick, your consideration for that quick um, caucus. So I'm um, back on, on the record. Carter, did you want to start first? Yes, thank, thank you for your indulgence, Gary. Um, I, I was reminded by one of my team members um, during the break that even according to the state's data that's been published, and, and I'm not throwing my brethren and sister in Indian River um, under the wolves, to the wolves, but Indian River's average teacher salary shows 55,892, which is higher than Palm Beach County School District. So anecdotally, we, we, are, we are going to try to determine, as we've kind of anecdotally heard, that some districts might, might be reporting the millage as part of that average salary. So I think that once we're, we have an opportunity to get into the data, we'll see the variations between any districts and bring that forward. Thank you for allowing me to comment oh, on Oh, most that. definitely, Thank most you. definitely. So I'm gonna make my way to, to the podium. So what I have for you is, is just the, the background information or, or presentation that we want to, to leave with, with the district with respect to MCEA's um, speech language pathologist uh, supplement counter proposal. Now this is, we're still um, working on this uh, counter proposal, the, the, the math, and we'll be ready to bring that back to you when, when we get a, a response for the pay for performance because it's somehow connected to the to the pay for performance. But we, we definitely want to see which direction the district is, is going with respect to pay for performance before we um, put out our, our speech language pathologist uh, counter proposal. So this is what I, I wanted to introduce to you. I, I did have the opportunity after the district made their their proposal to meet with some of the speech language pathologists for, for the district. Had a, a very good conversation with, with some of them. And I'm hoping that what I took from that conversation does justice to the conversations that we held on that day. But this is overall um, a summary of, of what that conversation with the speech language pathologist in this district. Uh, this is the information that I gathered from those conversations. So I hope that I'm doing them justice, but the first thing that they pointed out to me is the current facts and figures. And I know that it changed a little bit since uh, I put this presentation together because we're, we're listing nine employees, um, speech language pathologists. It's my understanding that that number is now eight. And we have one employee speech language pathologist assistant. We have 24 contracted speech language pathologists four contracted speech language pathologist assistants. And we're not quite sure of the number of speech language pathologist positions that are open here in Martin County. So one of the, the, um, the heaviest parts of our conversation was the negative impact of not having enough SLP positions uh, covered in, in, this, in this district. And they talked about the limited services for students. Um, if, if I can convey or summarize the overall feelings of the SLPs that I spoke to, money in their pocket wasn't the number one priority. All of their concerns, 
to, to the point that it had to be edged. Like, well, so what do you think we, we should be asking for? But their concerns, 95% of it was related to the services that are being delivered to the students. That was their most, um, their, their most pressing concern. So with fewer SLPs, the school districts may struggle to provide adequate speech and language services to students who require support. And this could lead to delays in identification and intervention for speech and language disorders, potentially impacting academic performance and social development. The increased caseloads. When SLPs are understaffed, the existing professionals may have larger caseloads, making it challenging for them to provide individualized attention to each student. Larger caseloads can result in reduced quality of services and limited time for proper assessment and treatment planning. The long wait times. Students in need of speech and language services may experience longer wait time for assessments and intervention. Delays in receiving support can hinder a student's progress and potentially exacerbate speech and language difficulties. The impact on academic achievement. Speech and language skills are closely tied to academic success. If students with speech and language disorders do not receive timely and appropriate intervention, they may struggle with reading, writing, and overall academic achievement. Limited collaboration with teachers. SLPs often collaborate with teachers to support students in the classroom. Understaffing may limit the ability of, of SLPs to work closely with educators, hindering the implementation of strategies to support students with speech and language needs. The increased workload for other professionals. Teachers, special education staff, and other professionals may be required to take on additional responsibilities related to speech and language support in the absence of sufficient SLPs. This can lead to burnout and decreased effectiveness in their primary roles. And, and I think that that's what, what we're seeing here with the um, most recent resignations. Compliance issues. Schools are required to comply with regulations related to special education services, including those for students with speech and language disorders. Understaffing may lead to challenges in meeting legal and regulatory requirements, potentially resulting in compliance issues and legal consequences. Difficulty in early intervention. Early intervention is crucial for addressing speech and language disorders effectively. Understaffing may impede the ability of the school district to identify and intervene with students at an early age, potentially leading to more persistent and severe communication difficulties. And finally, parent, parental frustration. Early intervention is crucial for addressing speech and language disorders effectively. Understaffing may impede the ability of the school district to identify and intervene with students at an early age, potentially leading to more persistent and severe communication difficulties. So how does Martin County compare to our Treasure Coast neighbors in SLP pay. So I have a little bit of, of comparisons for you. Martin County, the, te the teacher base pay is 48,700. SLP's contract is on instructional staff position, um, 196 days, 10 months. SLP's are placed on a placement schedule by steps of year or years of experience. Advanced degree supplement, for masters 2,400 if hired prior to 2005. Advanced degree supplement is 2,717 if hired after 2005. For the triple C certification is 1,850. In Palm Beach County, their teacher base pay is 57,813. Advanced degree supplement for a master's is 3,000. Certificate for clinical <laughs> competence, the triple C is 2,000. Additional supplements for traveling to certain locations in the, in the county can get up to $10,000. Martin County in comparison to St. Lucie County, teacher base salary for St. Lucie County is $47,500. SLP contract is on the instructional staff position, just like it is here. SLPs are placed on the placement schedule by steps of years of experience, just like it is here. SLPs earn an extra $10,000 on top of your step as follows, 2,000 for master's degree, 4,000 for master's in speech language pathology, and 4,000 for the triple C. In Indian River, their teacher base salary is 47,500. The SLP contract is on instructional staff position on 196, just like it is here in Martin. SLPs are placed on the placement schedule after determining their years of experience, similar to here. 
15% of the amount of the placement schedule with years of experience that base pay is additionally awarded. For example, if you have 20 years of experience and are earning 53,000, 15% of that <laughs> is 8,085. SLPs with, with the triple C is paid um, the specialist advanced degree supplement of 3,909. SLPs without triple C's are paid the master's advanced degree supplement of 2,953. SLPs receive 10 extra days at base pay for 206 days and typically evenly split at the beginning and the end of, of the school year. That is equivalent to one additional paycheck and they are eligible for performance pay. And this is a little side by side comparison when we're looking at years of experience. So if you look at, at, this, at the bottom column for no experience, those are the numbers that I just went through and reviewed. When we go to five years, 10 years, and ultimately 20 years experience, you'll see that those numbers increase somewhat. So that's where Martin County is, is um, in, with respect to the other counties in the Treasure Coast. Now, one county in the Treasure Coast I left out, and that's Okeechobee. The reason why I left Okeechobee out is because I had a conversation with Dr. Stanley. I think he's like the Julie Sessa of, of Okeechobee. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he's the he's the Julie he's the Julie Sessa of, of Okeechobee. Or is Julie the Dr. Stanley? Of Martin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I echo those those sentiments on Julie. He is a, a really nice a really nice guy. The difference between what we have in the Treasure Coast and, and Okeechobee is that they only have one hired SLP staff member. That staff member isn't in a bargaining unit. That person is considered administration. All of their speech language pathology work is contracted out, and that one SLP administrator is in charge of that, of that program. So it's completely different from the rest of, of the Treasure Coast. So I didn't include them in our, our comparables, but I wanted to give an explanation as to, to why. On my way over, I had um, President Freeland, with well, President Jennifer Freeland. Um, president Jennifer Freeland is the president of, of Indian River. Her brother, David Freeland, is the president of St. Lucie. And they've been instrumental in helping me get an understanding of how their structures work. But, President Jennifer Freeland in Indian River said to me um, at 547 today, we have 28 speech pathologists, two vaccines, and, 20, and 25 are from the general fund, and three are out of the ESC funding. So they currently have, um, have 30, 30 speech pathologist um, positions filled. And I didn't know that looking at uh, prior to coming in here and making this, this presentation, but you would see in comparison what Indian River gives their SLPs is the reason why they have all of their positions filled there in, in, in Indian River. So how do we fix this problem? I think it is getting on, on par, and, and that's a, a, a lazy um, acronym for prioritize, allocate, and, and reduce. We want to prioritize the recruitment and a retention of qualified speech language pathologists. We want to allocate appropriate resources and ultimately reduce the caseloads for our um, speech language and pathology employees here in the district. And we're working on a proposal that we think would um, accomplish these, these goals, but just wanted to provide that background information with you just to know what we're considering with uh, respect to our our uh, SLP counter proposal. At this point, I'm willing to take on any questions that you may have at this time. I have a quick question, Gary. Can you bring up the slide? I think it's slide 10 mm -hmm. right there. Can you blow it up for me? Because it, it, okay, so what, what are you, when you say Martin County, <clears throat> 50,000 base, how many years of experience are you using? And the reason is I pulled up Palm Beach County's salary schedule, mm -hmm. and I am not seeing the 57813. 
three, but it lands between 18 and 19 years of experience. So what I did was I said, okay, let's look at our number, which is the 50,000, and it's because of compression, obviously, it's somewhere, and this is pending, mm -hmm. I can't see that very well. It's right around 20, between 20 and 21 years of experience. So are we comparing, I'm not sure what years, what years of experience you're using. It says 20 years of experience, so in Palm Beach, it's a little different. Yeah, so, so with, with this slide, we were just attempting to show, um, because all of the, the figures that I went through was based off of no experience. We just wanted to get an estimate of what it would okay, look like to hire um, someone, a SLP, with five years experience, fair or enough. 10, or, or 20. Okay. So th that, that's the justification, but I think the, the major focus of, of it would be, would be the first the, the first line with, with no experience, because as you increase in experience, none of the add-ons change, right? You still get yeah. the masters, you still get triple C, et cetera, et cetera, right? When you go down to the zero or no experience, mm -hmm. we have Palm Beach 57813. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, I have it up, up on my screen. Their base is, their base is 51.5, so maybe there's a little, and you did say that some of this data may have changed, so. Yeah, it, it, it could have changed. We're fine with that. Because I, I didn't personally calculate this <laughs> sure. data. data. I, okay. I, I, um, I pulled it, so. Yeah. And um, we, we were on record, I, I believe, maybe the last session when we talked about this, was uh, we would love to hire more people in-house. I don't necessarily want to be spending more money outside for contracted services. You see what it's doing to the average. So at least, you know, that's something I know Mrs. Um, Estevez and I have been discussing. Part of the difficulty in getting them is that they have these covenants, to co not, covenants not to compete in place mm -hmm. where they're working for an outside agency. They can't, there are some legal restrictions that within a year they can't leave, or uh, you can speak to that a little bit better than I can. Mm -hmm. But believe me, this is on the radar. Yeah, and, and absolutely, we, we completely understand that position because you know standing in, in front of you as, as um, uh, service unit director for for um, the Florida Education Association, we we would be foolish to sit here and champion contracting the, the work out, right? Even though contracting would reduce the amount of individuals in our bargaining unit for perk certifications, et cetera, et cetera. Even in the long run, it's beneficial, but yeah. we still won't stand here and say <clears throat> we would prefer the district contract this this work out, so we're definitely on the same page with re respect to that. But um, the one thing that I can say is that we have a, a real dedicated group of, of SLPs here in this, in this district, and just having an hour-long conversation with them and just listening to them, I got a real understanding and appreciation of, of what they do for the students in, in, this, in this community. And I'm standing in front of you as a person that suffered severe stu a severe stuttering problem when I was a, a child. And through elementary, it was identified through um, my speech language pathologist teachers. And I was able to be introduced into several exercises to help me eliminate stuttering. And that's just taking a moment to stop and think what you want to say and, and before you get it out there. And I'm a personal living witness of, of the incredible work that they can do to give individuals like me the confidence to do public speaking, et cetera, et cetera. So we just wanted to make sure that we don't just put a proposal on the table and say, we're asking for this money. We want to try to give a justification and how these proposals would benefit and make this district a little bit more competitive with all of our surrounding districts because what we don't want them to do is run to these other um, school districts that, that our stones throw away when we can be keeping talented people and recruiting them in-house to deliver those great services to our students. I'm still able to take any other questions that you may have. All right.
Yeah, this blew that up. Bottom right. Gary, would you be able to send us that presentation? I think we may have more questions after we're able to delve more into the numbers. Um, Absolutely. Thank and you. I did email you the one that we presented, so just confirm. I also. Awesome. Thank you. Got an email from Carter 14 minutes ago. <laughs> So other than that, do you have any other proposals or presentations? Not at this, not at this moment. Okay, and I know, Gary, before you arrived, we um, did have a few language proposals and you should have them in the handout. I don't know if you want a caucus to consider those or if we want to bring them back at the next session. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring them back at the, okay. at the next uh, session. But I'm, I'm about to press send on this proposal, I mean this presentation for you, Christine and Carter, Julie, I CCG on this as, as well. Thank you. And would you be so kind to um, send that to Ms. Estevez as, as well? I don't have um, your email <laughs> pre-populated in my computer. I would have sent it to you myself. I won't be offended. <laughs> And Gary, I know we also discussed in our language proposals, um, we wanted to kind of have a conversation about substitute teachers. Uh -huh. It's Article 7, or I'm sorry, 6.7 and 6.12. We're just trying to figure out um, MCEA's stance on kind of the distinction between the two. Uh, how we look at it is more the short-term classroom coverage and then in 6.12, that's more of your longer term coverage? Mm -hmm. I think it's the other way around. Oh, it, it used to be, but with our changes, I think that's what we were trying to distinguish. Well, and that, just to recognize that Kelly Education now manages all substitutes. Mm -hmm. So that is a nuance that's different that we want to look at and make sure the language reflects or at least take into consideration that the district now has a long-term contract with a substitute staffing agency. So to clear those things up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So with, with respect to this, this language change, it appears on the surface to be um, So we're, we're striking out the term interim substitute and we're replacing it with just a volunteer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically it's, we're seeking out a volunteer from the teaching staff to provide yeah, I, that coverage. Yeah, I, I, would, I would counter that with, with that clarification because it just sounds like Anybody that raises their hand would be able to. to, 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 to. It's in there. Yes, it's from his say, or her yeah, teacher. It, it says a certified teacher. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. It does teach and the teacher will make it. <laughs> okay. So, Gary, yeah, all right. That, that was just yeah. my concern on the service. Yeah. If I may. Sorry. Yeah, you mean that? Yeah. So, so <clears throat> previously, the language that was struck was for an interim teacher. Yeah. Typically, an interim teacher is more long term, and it would be more. not just a bad example maybe, but <clears throat> let's say someone is going out on maternity leave, then you would, we would post the position for an interim teacher and fill that position until that person returned. 
right? So that article was, was dealing with that. Now, what we, I think the direction we'd like to go is instead of Article 6.7 being the interim teacher, we have still retained all your rights in terms of, quote unquote, getting first dibs of covering a class. So everything, everything there in the language still, still is per pertaining to short-term coverage. Mm -hmm. We haven't changed any language except for interim substitutes, which is sort of a misnomer. I believe what the direction we'd like to go is have some dialogue around Article 6.12, which basically says the same thing right now. Right. So we yeah. want to craft it in such a way that we deal with long term in that article. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. I think seven was supposed to be, be you know, I need to be two weeks and 12 is I need to today. So that's something that we'll work on. Right, but the way it was written before, I think that five seven was like I need you for two weeks, three weeks, whatever, and twelve was I need you today. Is the way I think it read. <coughs> That makes none, none of it being in the <laughs> I think both sections need to either be combined or cleaned yeah. up so that it's yeah. clear mm -hmm. what the distinction is. And right. I think right. that's where we were struggling and wanted to have a dialogue about all of that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I mm -hmm. can definitely yeah. understand that position. Mm -hmm. Regarding regarding the um, the inclusion of, of maybe formed for uh, letter C, um, was Article Seven Point Four, um, can can you clarify um, uh, the board's position um, or justification for um, including that language maybe formed? Yeah, I think the concern is that a lot of these committees are not actually meeting. Um, it's not any fault of either side. And I think to have such restrictive language in there sets everybody up for ULP, right? You know, are we violating the contract if we don't form it? Um, and both parties are kind of on the same page that it's not being formed at this point. So that's where, you know, it may be formed if both parties sit down and agree and say, hey, we need to have this committee, let's form it. Um, it, it just isn't forcing everybody to, to have all of these committees. Because if you look through the contract, it's, we probably didn't even realize how many committees shall be formed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that's where we're trying to make the language more permissive. Right, the mandatory. My fear is that in making it permissive, that it would become dismissive instead of permissive, right? So what I mean by this is, if it goes from that we shall establish this committee to, to May, who gets to decide whether we don't make this committee at all and not be a violation of our collective bargaining agreement? I think that the point that we need to take into consideration is how much grievances have been filed by MCEA with the Martin County School Board for failure to establish a committee. Like, th that's not even something that's on our, our radar. We're not looking to be malicious and <coughs> adversarial with the school district and for every I gotcha, push papers across from you and try to humiliate. That, that it, we don't get, any forward progression by acting in that in that manner. For one um, instant that I can remember since I first came on as a service unit director for the Treasure Coast Service Unit, uh, previous president uh, Karen Resaniti has been incredibly vocal about establishing a supplement committee year after year. Like let's form the supplement committee. Let's form the supplement committee year after year no traction. But not once did we say, 
we're filing this grievance for the district. So I don't think that that's a, 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 an immediate issue from the district side because the, we don't gain anything from pushing a grievance saying that this committee wasn't formed because what would the resolution be but to establish the committee, right? So I think that we can have a conversation like we do with so much, so many other issues that um, comes across our desk. We can have a conversation with district um, administration or the stakeholders for that particular program or department and, and say, let's put our attentions to this without consequence of, of timelines or, or um, blowback from, from a, a grievance. So I, I can understand and appreciate the district's explanation, but if that's what the main concern is, we're not interested in, in pushing a whole bunch of grievances for failures to for failure to establish a committee. We would rather engage in productive conversations and get a calendar date on on discussing or establishing uh, those committees. Understood, and that's why I know we said, you know, was there any counter to that? Is there any language that you think would um, suffice? We certainly take it back to the board for consideration yeah. so well I would definitely like to to, um, to give these proposals the proper consideration sure. instead of, of rushing to sure. to a, um, a response That's so sure. we'll give it the, the proper consideration and being that we don't have a, a session schedule for next week we have a, a little bit longer to um, to meet and, and come up with some responses to these these proposals sure. Anyone else? And, and again, I just wanted to um, apologize for, for the tardiness. Sometimes these things you just can't, you can't fore, foresee. But um, my apologies for, for um, having you, you wait so long to get, to get started. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I think uh, both sides have some language to consider and uh, proposals to consider, and then we'll come back at our next session, discuss all of those. Uh, I don't think we have one scheduled, so when we go off, we will talk about dates. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we had the 12. Okay. I, I don't know if it was, if it was confirmed, but we, we, we will make a commitment to, to start filling out some of those dates okay. this week. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you.